Welcome back to the Stuff About Money podcast. I am Eric Garcia, Certified Financial Planner, as always joined by my co-host, Xavier Angel, Certified Financial Planner. Hey, Xavier, in this episode, I'm going to tell a story about when I first started growing cold on Dave Ramsey. It's going to be a good story. So let's do some, some quick housekeeping, all right? So I'm just going to put it out there because I think this is going to help keep us accountable. So um, the producers of our podcast... One of them tells us that you move too much for the video. So, well, if you, he, he, yes, he tells me I move too much, but at the same time, he says that you don't stop with periods. I, I don't honor the period. I yeah. understand that. I don't honor the period. So, when he goes back and tries to edit these videos for Instagram, follow us on Instagram, plan wisely underscore. When he tries to uh, uh, edit these, he's you know you have to change the the ratio of the screen, and you go back and forth. So he's constantly having to move the the video to keep up with you i i, I know i i love i can't sit still and talk i love yeah. to move when i'm talking but you so i'm gonna try but, i'm gonna try but he also says that you are more precise with your words than i am uh, y- yes and I, I'm gonna, I agree with him on that yeah you know so i don't mean? honor periods and i use my hands too much so. that and and you know you get this other great topic that pops in your head and you run with it man and then somebody's got to rope you back in and bring you in that's all right. So we're going to try to do better on this episode. I, I doubt it. So if you're wondering what I'm talking about, go check us out on on YouTube, on our uh, YouTube channel. But if you like what you're hearing, follow us on your favorite podcast listening app. Follow us on social. Share these videos if you like them. So, all right. I'm at the YMCA. I'm jogging on the treadmill. All right. My son is in swim lessons or he's a swim team. Um, so I'm jogging on the treadmill, trying to trying to stay in shape while my kid's swimming. And I'm listening to Dave Ramsey podcast back in the day when I listened to Dave Ramsey. I was always curious to see what he had to say. What are you smiling at? You're already smiling. I, I, I'm smiling because I know these, when it comes <laughs> to these blanket <laughs> advice. That oh, really hold up, 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 hold that thought. So I'm, I'm jogging and he's talking about two things on this particular episode. He's talking about used cars or new or new cars and life insurance. And he says, you new car salesmen and permanent life insurance salesmen are thieves and they're robbing you if they sell you a new car or a permanent life insurance policy. And I, I, I totally offensive to me and I turned it off. From that day on, I grew cold with Dave Ramsey. Did it piss you off, Eric? Because I, I know blanket, you know, blanket recommendations really pisses you off. Yeah. I mean, how can you say that? So <laughs> number number one, and uh, there is a little bit of bias here. You know, I grew up in the life insurance space. My dad sold permanent life insurance. It's the individual with the most integrity that I know. So Dave Ramsey pretty much just called my dad a thief. And I was selling permanent life insurance at the time, called, called me a thief. Now, he, here's one thing. Here's one thing that I've learned about life insurance. When you start talking about life insurance, it's almost, not quite, it's almost talking about politics and religion. Like people have very, very, very strong emotions and strong feelings one way or the other about life insurance. And, and they do. You, you're always going to kill them. So okay. here, <clears throat> let, let me, let me kind of just say this as we, as we kind of enter into this topic, we are talking about life insurance and uh, we're going to keep it as exciting as possible, but this is something that's really important for you to uh, uh, listen in on. Um, Xavier and I were we we both came up in the life insurance space initially. That's kind of like our our first taste into mm-hmm. the financial services um, space. We're both taught to sell life insurance. We both believe in. Stop me if I'm if I'm saying something inaccurate, Xavier. We both I... believe in the value of life insurance. But we've also come to believe over our career that it is mm-hmm. not the end all be all solution to any financial woe that you may have. So one thing that you did say in there, um, we came up selling life insurance. And I don't think we sold life insurance. Life insurance became a solution in the planning part that that we were putting out there for the for the uh, for the client. So I hate using that word sell mm-hmm. because it's not selling. 
it, it's presenting a solution. If now, that is makes that, sense. Yeah, but come on, man. That's just some like, that's anybody in sales. Like sales is important. Okay. The, the world it, business doesn't is. happen without sales, but like, is that, that just sounds like some kind of like, let me just, let me wrap it up and make it sound pretty. I'm not selling life insurance. I'm solving a problem. Isn't that kind well, of right. And, and you, and you get that. However, it's, it's, how are you presenting it? You know, are you, are you make, are you giving the individual a solution rather than just going out there and telling everyone they need it. But before we get into that conversation, let me let me say one thing. And this is what prompted uh, us to have this conversation today. Mm -hmm. Did you know that September is Life Insurance Awareness Month? I, I was aware that September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. So yes, September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. And I think yes. one of the reasons why we focus on it in the month of September is because of a stat that I pulled up prior to the show. In 2020, 54% mm -hmm. of Americans were covered by life insurance. 54%. So just over half okay. of Americans. All right, let me throw this stat out at you. So you're saying 50, so that means what, 46 are not covered Correct. by life insurance. Of the 50, and I don't, I don't know if we have this number, of those 54%, uh, we're, we're, we're going to break down the different types of life insurance. But a lot of those policies are term policies, all right? Did you know, mm -hmm. did you know that that 99% now this is, this is a, there's depending on where you read the stat, let's say somewhere between 95 and 99% correct of term life insurance policies, never, ever, ever pay a claim 95 to So that means mm -hmm. one to 5% of term policies actually pay a death benefit. Right. And, and we look those numbers up together. Now, one of the things that I want to preference um, to our listeners is the reason why that is that is a huge number. But part of why that number is, is so big is because of one of two things. Um, the first number that we got out is a lot of those policies wind up lapsing. And the second reason why that is so high is because when we purchase term insurance, we outlive that term. Mm -hmm. The terms so, expire. Term Terms yeah. expire. And now, the number let, that I let me, let me let me make it let me just make a quick statement here. If you're listening and, and you happen to not listen to the entire episode, I want to make it perfectly clear that I am not suggesting that you don't own life insurance. I believe that life insurance is an important part of most people's financial plan. So I just let me just put that out there in case you jump off and 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 you you heard Eric say that huh, most life insurance policies don't pay out. So let me just go ahead and cancel my life insurance. I am not saying that. That is my disclaimer. I'm moving my hands to emphasize that point right now, Mr. Producer. Okay, deal with it. Carry on. And 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 I'm going to back us up a second um, because when we started, you know, one of the comments that I made was how blanket advice pisses mm -hmm. you off. Mm -hmm. But here we it are. Does. Yeah. Here we are, and and we're having this podcast, and. You and I are debating because we we do when it comes to life insurance. We we do debate often yeah. on whether or not we need life insurance and how much life insurance do we have. So mm -hmm. two so, minutes ago, you said that Dave Ramsey pisses you off because of the blanket, um, you know, or, or are you calling me out? That's given. You're about I to am call calling me out. you out. Call me out. Okay. All right. Because now you think I'm giving blanket advice. Yeah. All right. No, that's fair. That's fair. You know, anytime you 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 put something out there, you you know, you're giving you're giving advice. Let, let me just say this: if I ever give advice, I try to localize it as much as possible. In this situation, this seems to make sense. To make a mm -hmm. statement like, "If you sell permanent life insurance, you're a thief." Mm, that's pretty blanket. If you have young children, a mortgage, and a business, it's probably a good idea that you have a lot of life insurance because if something happens to you. It's going to put your family in a precarious situation, or, or my advice tends to be pretty, uh, I would say, timeless in terms of of prudence and stewardship. If you want to be financially secure, spend less than you make, save as much as you can, don't do anything foolish with your money. Life insurance is one of the many financial tools that we have to plan for our financial futures, to plan for the financial catastrophes that could possibly happen. So yeah, I might, it might sound like I'm giving blanket advice here, but I'm trying to localize it as much as possible. 
So then that, that brings there. us to that, that first part of the discussion. You know, do I need life insurance? I get all, I get asked that question often, and, and I'm sure you do in our planning, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're sitting down with individuals and they ask, do I need life insurance? Well, we were taught, Xavier, we were taught as young life insurance salespeople that if you love somebody or if you owe somebody, you need life insurance. Is that not, is that not true? That, that is, is that, that is true. So we, all we my friends, all that. my friends who are listening, who are our insurance guys are probably rolling their eyes right now at me. Um, <laughs> but do I need life insurance? Do I? Okay. Tell me my, my response to that is, and, and you guys have heard me say this before. It depends. Oh, okay. You know, it depends on, on a lot of factors. Mm-hmm. You know, is there someone, a child or, or individual that relies on you from a financial standpoint? Okay. If so, then I believe you need life insurance. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, hold on. Let me let me push back there. Mm-hmm. So let's say that I've got somebody who's financially dependent on me. I'm working, I'm earning money, I have an income. If I die, my income stops. Presumably, the care of that individual who's financially dependent on me stops as well. But what if I've got millions of dollars in an investment account? Do I need life insurance? I still believe you need something. Why? Yeah, you know, and and again, it. What's the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Why? Why do I need it? If I've got if I've got five million dollars in the bank that can generate a couple hundred thousand dollars of of ongoing income for my child if something happens to me, why do I need life insurance? Well, now I got to come in and, and look at several different things. Am I am I looking for mm-hmm. um, an income replacement? You know, am I looking at it from an estate planning standpoint? Mm. Um, am I looking at, you know, do I want to create a larger legacy? All um, right, let's, let's stop real quick. So you said you, let's stop at estate planning. So estate planning, oftentimes when we're talking about life insurance in the estate planning space. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes it's associated with paying a tax, right? My estate Correct. is beyond a certain amount. There's a potential tax bill that happens after I die. The question is, do I, does it come out of that? I'm making this. I don't have five million dollars in a bank account, y'all. I wish I did. Um, is it coming out of my five million dollars in my account, or should I have the life insurance company pay it? Right. That's that's a good question. That's Correct. if you have an estate tax problem. We're right now currently in an environment where that 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 um, that threshold is really, 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 really high. There's very, very few. Americans who are going to have an estate tax problem when they die. However, that's something to change. When I first came into the business, I want to say that threshold was at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars was the limit. So if you died with an estate over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you were subject to an estate tax. Now it's over what ten and a half million somewhere around there. It's been yeah, indexed around there. Or 10 11 and a half, million. eleven million. So. Um, so if you own a house and if you own a life insurance policy, which is considered part of your estate, you have an estate tax problem. Therefore, at that time when we first came into the business, owning life insurance made sense so that mm-hmm. your dependents weren't burdened with that tax. So you have an estate tax problem. That's a good reason to own, to own life insurance, right. even if you have a lot of money sitting in the bank. Correct. All right. So it depends. Your answer depends. We're right. st- I'm still tracking you. And okay. then you said the sec- the third thing. What was it? Leaving a legacy. Do I want to Leave create a legacy? A legacy? Mm-hmm. Do I want to build a larger legacy for my heirs, whether yeah. it's my children, my grandkids, or my great grandkids? Yeah, let me let me throw one more in there. Um, what if you want to support a particular charity, or if you want to leave money to a specific nonprofit, or your church, or your synagogue, or whatever it may be? Life insurance is a great way mm-hmm. to to create. Um, um, that, that gift beyond. Correct. I mean, look at, look at our local schools, right? Mm-hmm. Our local high schools here in New Orleans. Oh man. We're giving towards our schools on a regular basis. You know, I, I think one of, one of the, and, and some of the schools they do, uh, their alumni take out these large life insurance policies mm-hmm. and name the school. They pass away. These, these monies go to the school. And they can build these buildings or tracks or, or whatever they're going to do with the monies. 
but yeah. they are leaving something to the charities. Yeah. That's a huge space in the life insurance space, the charitable mm-hmm. giving space um, where people with, with lots of funds and, and maybe they don't have lots of funds, but they have a life insurance policy and they name um, these charities or these nonprofits, be it a school, a university. That's where you see some of these huge, uh, um, some of these huge uh, endowment funds are being funded by death benefits uh, from from life insurance, but most of most people listening to this podcast are not Uber. They're they're not Uber wealthy. Okay, and that's where the income replacement piece comes in. Yeah, because that's I, I would an say this part the, of it as well. For me, the first thing that's important for me, the first thing that I want to address when I'm sitting down with a client, we're talking about plans, financial plans, is what happens if income stops? How do we replace that income? To me, that is the the OG, actually the OG reason for life insurance, I think if you trace it back historically, it was for burial planning. It was communities coming together saying, hey, look, you know, this cat over here died. He didn't have any, they don't have any money to bury him. So what if the community comes together and buries him? Then all of a sudden people started putting, you know, right, contributing to a pot of money um, so that the community had money to bury individuals. We see that today. Right. Uh, we we said today, someone passes away without life insurance. There's some type of fundraiser or go, go fund, fund me, me again, or fish right. fries or, or whatever it might be. Uh, right. So, so life insurance does have obviously um, mm-hmm. a place. Can and we... and I'm going to, I'm going to throw this piece out there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, keeping this conversation rolling. Another question is when should I get it? And the answer to that is the earlier you, you, you get life insurance on yourself, the better, because typically life insurance is going to increase eight to ten percent per year. Uh, because is it it's that much? Off, Holy it's, smokes! It's based off of age. It's based off of health. So as you get older, those premiums begin to get more expensive, and it's eight to eight to ten percent every year. Holy cow! But here's the dilemma: it's when it's cheaper, and you need more of it. You you have less money to buy it, right? right? I I can tell you I've been in this I've been in the the financial space for twenty one years, um, and and anecdotally you you see that you know when you when you talk to younger people who need more life insurance they have less discretionary income to buy it, but as they age they have a lot more money, and oftentimes a smaller need because maybe that that dependence of people or the financial dependence of individuals on them. Is smaller. The kids are off at, off in college already, or their mortgage might be paid off. So the the, the right. you know the the need and, has. And, and, and you know, Eric, when we start looking at that, so over the last twenty one years, life insurance has actually gotten less expensive. Those premiums have come down, and we we talked about that high number of term insurance or that high percentage of term insurance never being paid out. Mm-hmm. When we look at that term insurance. However, if planning is done properly, you can go out and get more coverage utilizing that term insurance and putting permanent insurance or a piece of permanent insurance in place as well to cover both of those both of those needs. All right, let's let's pause here. You, 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 we, we've been talking about when and why do you need life insurance, but you just talked about term and permanent. We haven't talked about mm-hmm. types of life insurance. Could you break down for us? the difference between term insurance and permanent insurance. So term insurance is, is exactly what it says. It, it covers you for a period of, of time. And the insurance companies have come out and you could do a 10 year or 15 year or a 30 year policy. Okay. And the premiums on that, let's say 30 year term policy are gonna be a lot less expensive than doing a permanent policy. I have coverage over the next 30 years and the premiums are guaranteed not to increase over that 30-year period. Okay. Now, after that 30-year period is where we begin to see those premiums increase on an annual basis. So term insurance isn't necessarily only good for the term. Term insurance, the premiums are guaranteed for that term, but the policy will Correct. continue on, but it just becomes unaffordable beyond Correct. that. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that millennial that's that's just getting married, and mm-hmm. just starting that their first career or their first job, term insurance could be a great place for them to start. Mm-hmm. They need the coverage. They have they now have those responsibilities. 
but they don't have the income to go with it. So let me go ahead and get a term policy to start. Okay. The second, yeah. the, the, go, the, go the second type that you mentioned is that permanent policy. Permanent insurance gives you guaranteed premiums from today all the way out to, let's say, age 100. But you have that coverage in place all the way out to, generally speaking, that coverage is in place to age 121. So permanent life insurance, if designed and funded properly, properly, correct, is going to last you last you out to a maximum age of to the day after you die, to the correct. day after you die. Hopefully, that's that's the correct, goal. correct. Now, now, but that's not necessarily the case because even when we look at some types of permanent policy, we see the lapse rates, meaning policies that that go away because premiums mm -hmm. weren't paid, right? Incredibly well, high as well. You mentioned something important. You said if designed properly okay so if 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 we're sitting down and we're in the design phase of this permanent policy if designed properly then it's generally going to stay all the way in, until you just decide you don't need it anymore or you pass away mm -hmm. you know over over the last 20 years um in the business and i spent 18 18 19 years uh, with an insurance company if I had to throw out a percentage of, of what permanent policies are still on the books for me, I'd probably say between 95 and 98% of the permanent policies that I wrote are still on the books mm -hmm. because they were designed properly. Gotcha. Okay. Now, you also, when we, when we look at permanent life insurance, there's a couple uh, flavors, if you will, or varieties of permanent. Your background also is in one of the original kind of old school types of life insurance called whole life. In Correct. fact, a lot of people will say there's two types of life insurance term and whole. And I always push back. I'm like, no, no, the whole is a type of permanent. So whole life, one of the, one of the defining characteristics of whole life is that the death benefit is guaranteed so long as you pay your premium, whatever that premium is. So Correct. the only way that a whole life policy will lapse is if you stop paying the premium. Correct. Okay. So that's generally. that's whole life, generally, yes. generally. But yes. that's that's a that's a pretty fair statement, Correct. okay. And then back in I want to say like in the fifties or sixties. So one of the one of the things that that sets permanent policies apart from term life policies is permanent policies have a cash value account. There's an account that's accruing cash, okay. And that we, we're not going to get into the specifics of how you mm. can use that cash and what the cash can do, but that's typically. A differentiating factor. There is the potential to accrue cash in a permanent policy. Whole life policies are paid a guaranteed rate by insurance companies. And then back in the I think 50s, 60s, 70s, interest rates are rising. Insurance companies said, wait a minute, why are we going to just wait for the insurance companies to declare some type of dividend when interest rates are rising? We can we can credit these cash value accounts some type of interest rate based off of the interest markets. And they came out with what they called adjustable premium. We call it universal life today. So the premium where a whole life is a fixed amount, generally, mm -hmm. universal life said, no, no, you can pay as much or as little as you want as long as you're coloring, covering policy expenses. Correct. Those, we see a lot of those policies, unfortunately, lapsing these days because interest rates have done what? Well, right now they're rising, but mm -hmm. for from the 70s until, let's say, uh, 2000 and. 21, what did interest rates do? Right. They, they've, they've come down dramatically. They've come down. So, Eric, I'm also going to say this. And, and for those that don't know me, you know, Eric mentioned my background on the insurance side. I get excited when I start talking about whole life insurance and permanent coverage. So, um, even with so those policies that Eric was, was discussing, the adjustable premium. Uh, universal life policies. Um, they have been, the insurance companies came back and took a look at them over the past six to eight years. Mm -hmm. And now we have guaranteed premium universal life policies. Yeah. So what that's allowed us to do now is to come in and purchase a universal life policy and have a guaranteed premium that will take that policy out to whatever age you design it. Yeah. So, I so it's almost like say, it's almost like a um a permanent term insurance policy because that's not an official term, but it's almost like what if I could price a term policy to last me to age 95 and I could pick mm -hmm. a guaranteed premium 
and I could have it last me to that age. That's almost what, what those are, correct? Correct. So I, I, you know, an analogy that I heard early in my, in my career was term insurance is similar to renting a house or an apartment. Mm -hmm. You sign that lease, that lease is good for a certain period of time, whether it's three years, five years, whatever it may be. And then you go back to sign that new lease and the landlord could actually come in and increase those premiums. You also don't have any equity inside of that, that um, apartment or house that you're renting. Whereas permanent life insurance, you've purchased that home. Now you have that 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 mortgage isn't going to change, mm -hmm. but you have equity building up inside that policy, and that's the benefit of having that permanent life insurance policy, is I have equity or I have cash value growing inside that policy. So, uh, kind of a quick story on that. I was recently working with a client, older client. They have one of these universal life policies and they have paid significant amounts of premium, a lot of premium. Okay. Thousands and thousands and thousands of premium per year. And uh, I was reviewing the the policy and I realized that there's th this policy is in jeopardy of lapsing. And this is an, an, an individual in their late seventies. Okay. So I'm reviewing this policy. I'm like, man, this policy could probably if, if everything stays as is status quo, you might only have oh, five to 10 years left on this policy. Their, their eyes lit up and I kind of explained and walked them through the policy and kind of, you know, we're, we're going to try to make some adjustments to make it last. Now, here's the thing. That policy has a ton of cash in it right now. All right. It's got several hundred thousand dollars of cash, but here's the problem. The cost of insurance continues to rise. So the cost of the premium or the amount of premium that needs to be paid needs to go up. So typically with cash value policies is if there's not enough premium being paid, the difference of the cost of insurance and the premium that's being paid is being pulled out of that cash value account. Mm -hmm. So in this individual's situation, that cash value account is about to start paying the premium that is very expensive and it's going to run out. If he were to say, I don't want this policy anymore, give me the cash and walk away. His net cost, the amount of money that he's paid for his life insurance premium over his lifetime would probably be lower than if he had a term policy over that same 40-year span because right. of that cash value. And that's that equity buildup that you're talking about. There's a there's an asset that he has. Right. Absolutely. Okay. And and look, we could we could do, you know, we could we could do several podcasts where we just talk about mm the benefits, the pros and cons of, of looking at permanent life insurance. Right. Um, but one of the other questions, and, and I want to move on, but one of the other questions that um, we hear a lot is how much life insurance do I need? Mm -hmm. That, and again, are you well, asking me? I'm asking you how much, how much life insurance do we need? Xavier, you need $5 million of, of term life insurance. I don't know. I don't know how much you need. Like it's, it depends. Right. It depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on what other sources of, of income do you have? Do, do you know, do you own a business that could you could sell or your estate could sell that that's pretty saleable? Do you have uh, how big is your 401k? Do you own the life insurance just to provide income for your spouse? Should you pass away? And then they, have, they can access your retirement. Do you have a pension? Do you work for a company that has a pension? Um what what else do you um how many kids do you have do you want to send your kid to stanford or do you want to send your kid to community college uh do you want to pay for your kid's school or do you not want to pay for your kid's school are you philanthropic right. and want to leave a lot of money to charity i i don't know how much do you tell me and those are so as an advisor or as a planner those are things that you're sitting down and asking the client that you're not just saying you need X amount of dollars. Yeah, You're actually and, having a conversation with. Yeah, them. and I, and look, I mean, we're 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 going a long time talking. For mm -hmm. any of you who have lasted this long listening to us talk about life insurance, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> right? Who wants to sit here and listen to life insurance for thirty or forty minutes? Here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway. Life insurance is not a one size fits all product. Life insurance is a tool. 
And if used properly, it can really solve a lot of jobs if it's used properly. If it's used improperly, what it's going to do is potentially rob you of the ability to grow wealth. All right. I'm going to say that again. I actually had this conversation with a, a, another financial advisor, and he was being a little provocative with this statement. But I understand what he was saying. And, and I, I appreciate the statement because it actually sparked a lot of conversation in a, a group of other advisors that I'm in. He said, he said, life insurance. Now, before I say the statement, let me say this. I don't agree necessarily, nor do I know how to quantify this statement. But this is what it was. Life insurance has destroyed more wealth than it's created. And I would love to sit there and argue that with him. Yeah, I'm not saying I agree with it, but here's the point. Mm -hmm. If you don't use it right, how many people, how many times have you sat down with a client, whether yours or a client that someone else sold life insurance to, and they're putting in, we have this conversation all the time with, with clients come to me and say, hey, look, I sat down with a life insurance guy and they think I should be putting all this money into a life insurance contract because of these reasons. And they give the reasons why. And I, I understand the reasons why. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. Can you really cash flow $2,000 a month of premium for the next 20 years? Because if something happens between now and the 20th year, and you can't pay your $24,000 a year of premium, then let's say you're able to do it for 10 years. That $240,000 that you just cash flowed and you can't continue to pay it, you have just probably are and, going and, to lose it. And that that is that is a challenge. So Eric, it, it's it's all about planning and and utilizing the tools to meet the goals that you have. So there there's another there's another question that we get often and you and I have had this debate on numerous occasions. Do I need life insurance on my child? You know, I'm all for it. Um Putting insurance All right, on give, my child. Well, okay, give me reasons why, 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 why should you buy life insurance on your kids? Life insurance on my children is giving me the opportunity to lock in their insurability. What does that even mean, man? That sounds that sounds some like some insurance voodoo. <laughs> I don't know what my <laughs> child's health is going to be. Okay, from the day that we purchase it, and let's say I get it at three, age three, age four, I don't know what their health insurance, their health is going to be from that particular time up until they turn 25, 30, 35 years old. Mm -hmm. So by purchasing a policy on them, I lock in that rate, I lock in that premium, and I have that death benefit for them when they get older. Mm -hmm. You know, we see we see health issues on a regular basis, you know, child onset diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, we see you know, individuals beginning to smoke cigarettes when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. All of that affects what those premiums are going to be for you at a later date. So what you're saying is buy life insurance when they're young, when they're healthy, or before any type of illness kicks in. Therefore, that if something does happen, at least they have something to carry them through their life. Absolutely. You know, and then when we start looking at it from a permanent life insurance um, standpoint, the premiums are a lot less expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to throw out a number. These may not be exact. Um, I could go out and get a twenty-five or a fifty thousand dollar whole life policy on a two to three year old child, and it may cost me anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars per month. Whereas, I, if I wait until I'm thirty years old, that same policy is going to cost more money. Mm -hmm. So I'm locking in their health, their rate, and I'm capable of being able to go in and purchase a policy for a smaller premium. Yeah. All right. So someone comes to you, or let's let's just say someone has credit card debt and they've got young kids and they could be paying that twenty, thirty dollars a month towards their credit card debt, or they could be paying it to life insurance company for their child's life insurance policy. How do you advise that? That, that, that's the pushback that I get is most of the time when kids are young. Now, let me just say this for the record. My kids all had life insurance when they were born. I didn't buy it. My dad actually funded a policy um, for them. Okay. So he was in the life insurance business. That's kind of, that's, you know, in life insurance, everyone should own life insurance. So the kids had one and I look back and I'm thankful. This was a particular type of policy that had the cash value was invested and it gets stock market like returns. Okay. 
called the variable universal life policy. Um, so we've got these policies with some, some cash in it. My kids may or may never have to buy life insurance again if they don't want to. Um, so I, I benefited from having that policy, but I'm going to tell you, man, when I was, when I was young and starting my career off, I don't know if I would have been able to cash flow money to fund a policy for. I mean, there were so many other things pulling for my money. Now I, I owned life insurance because I, I recognize if something happened to me, the impact that it would have on, on the family that I obviously purchased for myself, but I don't know. It just seems you, like, uh, look, you, you asked that question. What would I do? with the client that comes to me and says, I could be using that money elsewhere. And then it, it, if if that is the case after sitting down and, and doing and putting together a plan for them, then we may not do it. You know, it's mm -hmm. not for everyone. You have to have, you have to be able to, and capable to have that cash flow to be able to go out there and purchase it. So here here's here's kind of how I would approach it. Okay. There is a, and if you're watching the video, you, you you can see this. If you're listening, just imagine in your mind's eye. There is a spectrum, okay, of financial decisions that are acceptable. And there's things outside of that spectrum that are unacceptable. I am not against life insurance on kids. It's something that I generally am not going to initially recommend just because of my own personal kind of values and just kind of what I've come to where, where I've kind of philosophically have fallen in the financial planning space. However, if you come to me and you had an experience with a family member or a young child or or something that is robbing your peace because of an experience, a child passed away, the family didn't have any money to, to bury them or whatever it might be, and that is something that is keeping you up at night and it's an issue that we need to plan for, then I am at one, I'm 100% game or planning for that problem because it's going to bring you peace. And if you're at peace, then it's going to hopefully allow you to do other wise things with your money. So that's kind of one of those things that I would say it falls within the spectrum of, of acceptable financial decisions, right. but let's make sure it fits within your plan and find a, 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 a good solution for it. Is it's that goals. fair? It, that is fair. It, it's, it's about what is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? All right. We're, again, for those of you who have listened all the way through, congratulations. Um, life insurance is not an easy thing to to talk about. And, and most of, we, we talk about it like nothing, but most people are like, mm -hmm. oh my God, life insurance, it means you're dead. So it's it kind of it kind of raises some <laughs> some some crazy emotions in people. And some people just don't even want to talk about it. But it is an important part. And here here's kind of where we come full circle. Um, and I want to make this point that Personal finance is personal. Everyone's situation is different. Your need for life insurance, the type of life insurance, the amount of life insurance you should own will vary from person to person. And that's why it's valuable to sit down with a planner to discuss that, to come up with the solution. Right. And now, we sell life insurance. We also give advice, okay? Always, always understand. I think this is this is good advice for anytime you engage anybody in the financial space. Always ask the question: What do they benefit? What does the person selling you a product, giving you advice, benefit from them giving you that that advice? Okay. In our space, there's something called a conflict of interest. In other industries, mm -hmm. they have it as well. Um, if your advisor is constantly trying to sell you life insurance to solve every single problem, then you got to stop and ask yourself. Wait, 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 wait. Is this what's right. best for me? Um, so always understand the person who's giving you advice. Even us, ask us, you know, what's in it yeah. for you? What, what's what's your conflict? Do we we this is something we disclose with our planning clients, um, our investment clients. Hey, look, these are yeah. separate engagements. We get compensated to sell life insurance. Um, but you know, our 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 ethics make us, and I say our, the certified financial planners hold us to this standard of fiduciary that says we have to give advice that is in your best interest, not my best interest. So always understand the perspective or the angle of the motivation of, of individuals giving you advice or selling you products. Give us some closing thoughts, Xavier. So, I mean, you, you basically just summed it up. We could close it with that. Okay. 
we'll close it with that. Xavier has no closing thoughts. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. Again, follow us on your favorite podcast listening app. Take care. Have a good one.